Come out with us and play Love Your London Have a banana In today's episode of Love Your London we check out some shoes that we will never be able to afford and watch them being made Plus we check out a part of the new river that is not culverted and we tell you about the watchman's hut which Sharon draws and which you can bid on if you are quick enough But we start our journey on Northampton Street and head towards what is now known as the Ivories, but which used to be the location of the Dane Man piano-making factory between 1893 and 1983. Dane Man pianos are now made in China, but we're glad to discover that music can still be heard from Unit 10, one of the many converted offices inside this complex. Hello. Hello, Are you Nigel? Mm -hmm. I'm Tristan from Love Your London. We are here in All Flutes Plus. Um, all, all with a lower case, I believe, is that right? All, all Flutes Plus? All, exactly. All, all, all written in lower case. Um, and uh, we're here with Nigel James, uh, who started the shop with his brother Trevor, I believe. Um, um, and this is, I think, well, it used to be in Dorset Street, and then it moved to somewhere else, didn't it? Yeah, we, were, we were 20 years in Dorset Street. Yep. Um, which is fantastic in Marylebone. Then we moved to Warren Street. That's right. Yeah. And we were 20 years in Fitzrovia in Warren Street. Yeah. And that was brilliant as well. Um, and then Covid came along. Right. And, and rents were not going down. Right. <laughs> and uh, so we were looking to streamline our operations, more efficient. Um, so we found these fantastic studios. Um, ex um, British piano manufacturing, the Ivories which obviously yeah. is very relevant to uh, to what we do. Yeah. Um, so very, very, very happy to have found here. Do you think that um, because you're specialising in flutes, you actually end up with more customers than if you had other musical instruments? Uh, well, for us, absolutely. Um, specialising in flutes has always been our forte. Yeah. Um, that is our strength. Um, I mean, some people might say it's a, a little bit of a weakness because we don't offer other instruments, but we prefer to do what we do um, really well mm -hmm. and really professionally and really look after our customers. So for us, that's absolutely paid dividends. And is it all types of flutes? Do you, or do you also, uh, is it like uh, metal ones or do you also do shakuhachis and sort of other things we like do, that? We do, we do some ethnic instruments um, and traditional flutes and folk flutes and older kind of bone system flutes in, in wood for instance. Yep. Um, I suppose mainly our business is, is modern classical flutes, yep. um, covering everything for flutes for beginners who are just starting at school, right through to those progressing onto more serious music colleges right. um, and then professional players of course as well, um, West End show players, orchestral players. Um, okay. College, college students, yeah, everything and anything to do with flutes. Yeah, I oh, see so you've got some piccolos here as well. Piccolos, yeah, um, we do a good range of piccolos. And, uh, and you do repairs as well as sell them? We absolutely do. That. Repairs are a very important part of our business. It was really repairs that um, started the business initially with, with my brother Trevor, yeah. um, essentially with a workshop from home. Yeah. Um, Realising there was uh, a, a, a great demand for someone that could actually work on flutes really really well mm -hmm. um, and then and it gradually kind of built up from there into a uh, complete specialist business. Okay. So we're, we're at the moment in the uh, music testing room, musical instruments. Yeah, yeah, uh, hey. testing, uh, testing studio. And I obviously have to ask you, um, with Covid and everything, uh, how is this affecting your business? Because I suppose people can't test things so easily, can they? Well, no, where we were in Warren Street, we didn't have any rooms with any external ventilation at all, yeah. although we had good room facilities. Um, so that was a problem there as well, partly why we moved here. This, this room has excellent external ventilation. Right. It's also separate from every other room. So we're actually quite confident now, um, especially as people are getting more and more vaccinations yeah. and double backed. Um, that it's not a problem. Sure. No, we're very careful about social distancing. Yeah. Any instrument that gets played is very thoroughly sanitised before and after playing as well and quarantined, so we're very careful about that okay. um, for sure. Uh, who's, who's yeah. It? yeah, the acoustics are really good here yeah. um, and also got a nice view into the courtyard. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. And, uh, and who is, uh, who's this? Is this it's that? George, my colleague. Yeah, yeah. Fabulous flute player. 
And if any, there's any doubt about that, then there's, there's also a baseball bat in the corner, so if there's any complaints, yeah, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, should I just play a snippet or something? Yeah, just, yeah. just sound bites. That's what we're at. Yeah, 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 that's cool. There we are. Anything you want. Yeah, I'll just play Thank you. Okay, so we are at Foster and Son. Um, hello there, Simon. How are you? How are you doing? Very good, thanks. Very well. Do you want to get my mask? Yes, I'll, I'll... Yeah, we're moving things around at the moment. Moving so. things around, that's okay. two businesses here, there's Henry Maxwell and there's Foster and Son. Okay, so, so, so they're both... Both boot makers, yeah. essentially, yeah. So Maxwell's is slightly older, so it dates back to 1750. It was originally a spurrier, and then started manufacturing boots, and Foster and Son just pure boot maker, essentially. Okay. And we just moved in, hence all the moving things around. So we moved from St James's, where we've been based for... Are you in, you're in German Street, is that right? We're in German Street, yeah. So we've been there since... Uh, Foster and Son's been there since 1840. Yeah, yeah. pretty much on German Street, actually. Yeah. So how come, I mean, did he change because of high rents, or...? Uh, we, well, I guess, yeah, partly. Our lease ran out, actually, last year, in the middle of the lockdown, which was pretty, oh. kind of fortunate, actually. So yeah. it allowed us to sort of just unlock from being there. We didn't need a shop anymore. Right. Um, we did have a nice shop there, but... We just didn't need it, it was huge, sort of 2,000 yeah. square feet. So um, we looked around and we found this space and it's just a, a bit of a downsize, but it's great because we've, we've actually got a bigger workshop. I mean, I take it, obviously, um, obviously a lot of shops can go online now, but you're, be, you're bespoke. Uh, fully bespoke. So, so, you, so people do have to come in for a fitting, I take it. Yeah, exactly. We used to sell ready to wear. Um, and then during the whole thing that happened last year, or the, uh, the lockdowns and everything, we decided to just stop doing ready to wear completely. Right. Um, and in that decision, obviously, we, just, we didn't need a shop, so we, um, so yeah, people have to come to us. There's always been the bespoke, we've always been bespoke shoe makers. Okay. So the bespoke side of things, everyone has to come and see us, we have to do measure, we have to measure them, um, and do fittings, and it's all made to measure, essentially, yeah. So, so Henry Maxwell is also in this building, or you're...? Yeah, well, we're the same thing. So you're all make, the same yeah, thing? Yeah, exactly, yeah, so, so it's, it's two companies. It's so you, have you also got the, um, can you also have that, um, seal? I mean, you, you, you yeah, can... that's from, that's from when we made the, um, riding boots for Her Majesty the Queen in 2006. Oh, ah, yeah. Fantastic. So, and, with Maxwell has warrants, um, every single, uh, monarch since George IV, essentially. So since George IV. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty old. Can we? Have, can we yeah. So, so yeah, you can have a look around if you like. Yeah. This is sort of like our storage at the moment. So we're just sort of figuring this out. Yeah, it does look a little bit like. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Really, yes. And so we're pulling all this stuff out as we speak. But um, this is going to go around the corner there. But we are actively making stuff here. So this is our pattern cutting desk. So okay. all the patterns, like the first part of the process is last making, yep. which is my my, I've had that this your, my your job. Last, lo, lo, your so I'm a last maker. Are you're right? okay. So this is for one of our clients and he's already had a fitting, but we've, I've just done an alteration. So when you do an alteration, you either take a bit extra yep. uh, of the wood off or you add it on if you need to make a bit more space for them. Okay. So I've added on a few pit pieces here and just filed them down. And then Reese who does our patterns He'll design the shoe and do the pattern like from this last on top of this last with yep. tape, um, and then that gets turned into like a card, sort of master copy of the last there, right? Of uh, the pattern, and this is then used to when we go to click the leather. Yep. Clickings when you get the whole skin of the, the calf skin or whatever it is you're using. Yep. And you put this on top and you find the best spot and then you get the knife and you cut out the piece of leather. Say this is the vamp and you'll cut around this and that'll be 
uh, put to one side along with all the other bits like quarters and um, any other piece you need and all those bits get put together uh, with some lining leather and sewn together closed um, and when you've closed it it sort of essentially looks like this it's like the upper yep um, it's quite a good example here it's like the upper stitched together with the lining yep um, and then this then goes to the shoemaker and the shoemaker will make an insole from a piece piece of leather um, which is basically the front he'll make it on the bottom of this so it's, it's dried it's wet and then it, it's allowed to dry on the bottom of the last so as you can see it's like a yep. copy of the guy's foot so it feel perfect it will perfectly fit his foot when he goes into the shoe it's going to feel like exactly like the bottom of his foot so it's going to feel really comfortable and I, and I take it you keep the casts in here in case they ever want a, another pair of shoes and they yeah, don't exactly. need to get yeah exactly lasts yeah. lasts, so, lasts. lasts yeah so you saw outside probably there's all those white bags mm -hmm. yeah well that's just a few of our lasts there's about, about 3,000 of them outside at the moment I have some of these I've, I've got yeah. strange feet I can show nice you some more interesting ones yeah okay yeah. Uh, I mean uh, you navigate the, right I, I, I mean obviously I, I don't know if you want to talk about costs and stuff or they're all different each person uh, well I mean it's well it in terms of getting a pair made it starts at five thousand pounds right so that'd be a calf skin shoe yeah um made to measure and that includes like the trees that are like the copy of the last that goes inside but it just goes it can just go up anywhere from there really so what's the most expensive shoe that you've made uh well it would be something in crocodile so if you make it in full croc, it's over ten thousand yeah. pounds. Right. So it just it, like if it's a boot, it's going to be even more than that. So it's just um, okay. pretty much. I mean, we make quite a few of those. It's you know it, they're pretty special. We have to make a car a calf version first, make yeah. sure the fits like exactly right, and then we make it fully up in croc. And we've got we've got a few going through, but, but I'm going to need ones here. I take it they last and last. I mean they. Oh they, yeah, yeah. They, and and if they do go wrong, do, can people bring them back and get them? Well, they kind of have to. Because they can only be fixed by us, really. Don't because wear them if in a swamp. yeah, goes back on the last. Gets because it's it's hand sewn. There's no machinery, so it's not machine stitched in any way. No. So it's like the 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 um, the soles like hand welted. Yep. So the shoemaker has to just take that off and then re-stitch it by hand back on. So you can't yeah. fix it with the machine. And would they have to pay for that again, or is that yeah, like yeah, that stuff's like wear and tear. So obviously yeah. the sole will have to be replaced maybe every year or two. Okay. Um and but. If there's something, I mean, obviously we'll, we'll service the shoe for, for people. Yeah. Like um, the gentleman just here, he's got some monk structures on the side there, mm -hmm. and the um, the buckle needed to be a little bit restitching, so yeah. we'll just bring it and do it. It's not. That's great. Yeah. So, That's and then yeah, about halfway through the, the initial process, you have to have a fitting, so it all stops, and then before the out outsole goes on. We stick. We um, we do a fitting. Yeah. And we just check everything. We do an alteration like the ones I showed at the beginning, and then the shoe gets completed. So now customers have to come here rather than. They're yeah, now they're going to have to come here. Oh, yeah, either that or we we visit. We go to America, and we go to Japan. Um, so we've been going to the, yeah US and Japan for decades really. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, everyone else is going to have to come here. Or there. Do, you, do you have people over there or, or do you have to go over there yourself or do you have that? I personally have to go yeah right. so yeah so it's literally just it's just us so the whole team is just literally the people you see in this room making all of those shoes yeah and you're going to be staying here or are you moving to uh, the place next door is that we're moving to the other yeah, unit one unit yeah one. so they're just lit we just moved in last week and we've tried to organize it as best we can to start some work and then while they're making up our unit there um, we've designed it ourselves, so it's going to be sort of designed around what we need, okay. and then we're going to be over there hopefully in a couple of months. Okay. And so you've got, um, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you've got the website uh, of this place. I'm not sure if any of our subscribers are going to be able to afford it, but you never know. There might be. Um, we, we, we've got so we've got a, a huge variety of subscribers. Uh, we've got a few in America as well, so you never know. Well, here we go. Look, there's a good one for American people. It's um, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Oh, there it is. Oh, right. now that's my goodness me. That's the price of admission. That right is that his his original. That's his. Yeah, this yeah. is. Do you see how it's been modified? Charlie yeah. Chaplin's. Wow. There you go. Marvelous. We don't yeah. have to blur those like out. Comedy. Do I do we have to blur these ones out? No, no, no. no the no, names no. of those this are is, um, private. There. This is Peter Sellers. That's great. We went, yeah. we already saw Peter Sellers' house when we went to. Um, 
Where was it? Muswell Hill. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we 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 um we already filmed outside there. Yeah, cool. Oh, wasn't that interesting? Wasn't that interesting? Um, Charlie Chaplin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Peter Sellers, all their old feet. Their feet, their feet casts. Last. Feet lasts. That's a lot. I, I think I, I mentioned I called them casts, oh, didn't I? I? Did. Well, you know what I mean. Cast last, it rhymes. Now, just up here we have Canonbury Grove, and just behind Canonbury Grove we have the canal. Actually, so it's not a canal. This is the New River. Now, I've been talking quite a lot about the New River designed by Sir Hugh Middleton um, and pretty much all of it is culverted between the River Lee and uh, Central London, Clerkenwell. Um, but, and as you'll remember, in an earlier episode we uh, walked down Duncan Terrace uh, which was following a long part of the, Mew, of the um, New River. But now we're going to actually see one of the very few bits of the river that is open to the elements that is non-culverted so we're just going to go in here this is the new river walk the new river uh, was uh, created um, in the 1600s um, now there has been a park here since 1860 um, but before the park was built back in the 1700s we have this and this here is the watchman's hut this is the watchman's hut 1700s fascinating little place with a little door there now what did the watchman do what would the watchman be looking at he's going to, he's watching the river he was looking for people throwing dead dogs and general rubbish into the video. I mean, we actually just saw there um, a sign saying, please uh, volunteer if you want to pick up litter. Um, back in those days, it was up to him or her, probably was a him, the watchman, I suppose the clue is in the, in the title, uh, to uh, scare off anyone who was throwing away particularly dead animals um, and general rubbish. Now, this river is generally more or less how uh, it was back in the 1700s one of the really one of the few original bits there is some wood there are there are some wooden parts just around the edge here which is original from the date uh, but other than that some of it has been reshaped um, now the reason why we're here apart from the fact this is a beautiful little walk the new river walk um, but the reason we're here is because Sharon is going to be drawing the watchman's cottage uh, apparently it's quite a it's a, it is a, something that a lot of local people um, have fallen in love with um, and uh, and especially people when they were younger they, they sort of like remember wondering what on earth who on earth lives in that sort of like is it a is it a witch or something um, perfect and I have a bench too so Sharon is going to draw it Great. now just our first drawing I'm gonna yes? do a little quickie she's gonna do a little, a little quick drawing um, now just to little explain a little bit why, we, why she's doing this, um, we rely on very few things to... Um, to Sharon, do you want to take it to... Okay, so one of... Okay. Okay, so uh, one of the ways that, uh, that we make a little bit of money um, is Sharon draws. Um, she sketches various different uh, things that people like to see um, and we then put it on eBay. So at the end of this episode there's going to be a link where you can bid for this particular piece. Um, it'll start off quite low, around about what, 
20 quid or so um, and uh, and you'll be able to see it obviously as well um, so uh, but that's one of the ways that we make money <laughs> the other way that we make money is obviously via patreon so if you wish to become one of our patrons we have a couple of fantastic patrons already uh, you may do so the details are going to be at the bottom of your screen but the best way you can help us is by sharing this video on your social media please do that uh, it doesn't cost you anything to do that like our videos as well because that really helps with the YouTube algorithms um, and uh, and just basically uh, subscribe to our channel if you've not already subscribed um, because uh, it's really important again it doesn't cost you anything if you have already subscribed don't click on that button again because otherwise you'll unsubscribe but do click on the bell because then that way you get a notification whenever there's a new video to come out anyway so we're now going to show a little bit of Sharon drawing this thing um, and uh, so it'll be sped up footage hope you enjoy it cool As you can see, this is a really nice little park, and as much as I'd love sitting outdoors drawing, I've had like a uh, a couple of near misses today, um, including right next to me. It's alright, I've washed my hands before, and I will wash them after. But um, in the meantime, misses from what? Um, birds. Yeah. It's, it's certainly not. It, you know, it's not a stuka. It's a pigeon. So uh, I've figured I'm not going to take a risk today, as much as I wanted to sit and draw. Um, as you can see, if you're you going to finish it off later, I'm going to finish finish the drawing off indoors. Um, this is kind of a dangerous place right now to sit and draw, and like I said, I've had two near shots already on the street, and there's one there on the bag. And as lucky as that may be, it's not it's not lucky on a drawing. But okay? so far, and, and so yeah, I've just done uh, this bit you've seen on the fast forward, and we're just going to now take off, and uh, our light our light is our light going, is going, and we still have a do. bit more filming to do, so. That's just a, a hoverfly. I'm not afraid of anything. That's not not for patting, though. Those ones. All right. And here is the finished sketch, done on acid-free paper. This drawing of the Watchman's Hut will be on eBay from the moment this video goes live, and will be available to bid on throughout the following ten days. All Sharon's previous sketches have sold, so you'd better be quick. The link is in the description on the actual YouTube page below, and bidding starts at twenty pounds. Good luck. And that's it for this episode. A little bit shorter than our usuals, but that's because we're really eager to start work on episode 6, which is going to be somewhat sensational. After checking out the amazing transparent Hauer King house, designed by the fantastic Jan Kaplitsky and Amanda Levit, we get approached by someone who is the nephew of one of the most famous people in Ireland, and he decides to tell us some very revealing things. But she admires him. We can't wait for you to see this episode. Just remember to hit that notification bell so you don't miss it. Till next time. From Acton Town to Wimbledon, from Brixton to beyond. Love your London. Have a banana.